Actually, any time you go to time, just put it under your tongue. So. Hell. Good morning, like, everyone. Chew on it and then no. leave it on. We're her. glad to see everyone joining us this morning, especially with the warm weather and summer here, and people okay, are still showing up to church, which is a miracle of God on its own. I'd like to invite everyone to find a seat, and, My God, well, and then Sam, as soon as you find that seat, oh, as we open our service so with <laughs> some more He's only going to decent now.
Just as we begin this service, just invite you to turn around and find a few faces to greet, people maybe you haven't seen for a while through our summer, and uh, see who we are with today. Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Well, as you are finishing up, I invite you to take your seat and grab your bulletin. Just want to highlight a number of items in our bulletin this morning. First off, we are pleased to uh, announce that we have hired somebody for our office administrator position. So Melissa will be starting uh, with her orientation on September the 7th and then beginning to uh, work her regular hours after that. And so we are, uh, we are quite pleased that she will become part of our uh, administrative work within our church ministries. So those of you who are part of church ministries, as you begin to think about the things that uh, those ministries might need support with administratively, uh, keep that in mind as we will be uh, training Melissa in that regard. So uh, we're very happy that uh, that is taking place. Got in the bulletin just the upcoming dates for the next elders and council meeting. A uh, big item to remember is our annual meeting comes on Thursday, September 15th, 
So we invite you to keep that on your calendar. It is that time of year where I get to begin to chase people for their uh, ministry reports as we need to have our reports into, our ha into the hands of our members uh, at least two Sundays prior to our annual meeting. So in order to do that, we need to collect the reports and begin putting that together now. So uh, just a reminder, they're actually due tomorrow. Um, I know some of you will go, tomorrow, I've been gone all summer. I don't remember that. Hmm, <clears throat> okay, you either go work real hard tonight or there's a little bit of leeway in there as I'm beginning to do the work to put the book together during the week. So uh, just to ask you to uh, look at getting that to me sometime, uh, preferably earlier in the week here. So, but please keep September 15th on your, uh, on your calendar for our church annual meeting. Uh, today, after our church service, we have uh, last nominating committee meeting. So just a reminder to that for those on the nominating committee, that will take place after our service. Most of our services, most of our ministries are on a break through the summer here. We are looking forward to them starting up during the fall, and we were talking about that at our council meeting this last week. Uh, we are very appreciative, both the elders board and the church council, for all of the work that's been done by our, our ministries, and particularly those who have been leading and organizing those ministries. But we don't want to take you doing that for granted. So over the next few weeks, you'll probably get a phone call uh, from, from somebody, either myself or somebody on the church council, just asking if, if, if this is an area of ministry you're looking at continuing on uh, in this coming season. And uh, so I invite you to uh, be giving some thought for that as you'll likely get a phone call in the not too distant future. Uh, nursery is up and running. I'm not quite sure the status of it today. I didn't see anybody on the schedule. There may be somebody down there. Uh, the uh, next week's schedule is listed there. Also a note, uh, our, sound and, uh, our sound and media people, uh, that's Kyle back there who keeps everything flowing, flow, flowing for us so well, better than my tongue getting tied here anyways. Um, so appreciative for their work. But they are needing a few more volunteers back there as we go into the fall as well. So if you are interested in looking at that, uh, and that's open to youth as well, often our youth uh, learn how to, hand, how to do that stuff a lot quicker than anybody else does, uh, please see, uh, see Kyle and he will uh, help you out with that. Oh, I see there's a happy birthday on there later on this week too. You'll have to note that at the bottom of your bulletin and make sure you uh, text that individual and anniversary there as well. Before we continue on with our worship in singing, we're going to uh, collect our morning offering. Uh, as a church, part of our act of worship it, it often is in the form of giving back to God out of what he has given us. Uh, many of people in our congregation do so online. Uh, we thank you for that, and some of you do that here as we uh, as we pass that around on Sunday mornings. If you're here this morning and you're a visitor within our church, we recognize you likely support uh, other, uh, other groups in other places, and just please feel comfortable with, with letting that uh, pass by. So at this time, I'd like to invite the ushers forward, and we will pray together. Lord God, I thank you for this morning that we can gather and worship you. I thank you for this place and the freedom that we have to be here, and just for one another. And as we come together, uh, both in person and online, I pray that we would be able to connect one, with one another just in your presence, to know a joy of one another. Lord, we don't want to come here and gather like we are uh, in a theater someplace watching something. We're here, Lord, to participate together in worship to participate in the music and worship, to praise you in song, to participate through your word, to participate as we pray together, to participate as, as we greet and fellowship and encourage one another. Lord, this morning as we gather, I pray that you would give us eyes to see that where some in our midst may need encouragement, that you would, that, that you would lead us in that way. Help us, Father, to celebrate together with a sense of joy and to weep with those who weep, and, and just to rejoice with those who rejoice. Lord, as we worship you and take up this offering and continue on with our, our, our time of worship and singing, I just pray that you would be honored in what we do here, 
that the offering would be used for your glory and for your purposes, both uh, in our community, in our church, and, and abroad. Um, we're just we're here to worship you and celebrate you today. In Jesus' name.
Thank you to the music team for leading us in worship through music, and we will be doing a little bit more of that later on in our service. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15, and going to chapter 8, verse 4. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do not want, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through the Lord, through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come to your word this morning, I just ask that your spirit bring clarity where my words may lack clarity. And I pray that this would be an act of worship unto you. We want our hearts and our minds, mine included, to be open to how your spirit would speak into it. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think some of you can relate. I have a certain gift that was given to me about 30 years ago, and I carry it around with me just about everywhere I go. So this is my mechanics Swiss Army knife. So I was an apprentice mechanic, and I think my mother-in-law gave this to me, oh, probably over 30 years ago, and it's got all kinds of gizmos in it. It's got my pliers, it's got my screwdrivers, it's got wire uh, strippers, and of course, for when I'm at the campfire and need a stick to roast a wiener, it's got a nice knife on it to sharpen the end of it. So um, I carry this with me pretty much everywhere. And when I don't have it on me, I really feel somewhat exposed. I feel somewhat like something is missing. And on the rare occasions I've misplaced it, it puts me in a panic searching for it just about everywhere. Now the reason I carry it is I have a strong aversion to being in the position of knowing what to do but having no tools available to do anything about it. I find that to be a frustration. It's a feeling of powerlessness. I've, I have fixed more things with this Swiss Army knife than, than probably anything in my mechanics tool chest at home. I mean, I, I, I do carry a set of tools in my truck because, you know, like, like most people these days, if you break down the side of the road, you want to have a tool kit there so you can open up, scratch your head, stare at it, tinker with a few things, and then call the tow truck. I mean, this, these days you can't fix a lot of things on the side of the road anymore, right? But the reason I carry it is because there's a frustration of feeling powerless powerless. It's kind of like, if only I had this with me, then I could. It was actually an experience we occasionally would have when I worked on the ambulance as well, and most people in healthcare will be able to uh, recognize that, that most people in healthcare are trained to a higher level of skill than they are actually allowed to use when they're in the field. And that was a frustration sometimes when I would go out on an ambulance call, or in particular when I went out by myself on a first responder call. I would have a kit, but the kit intentionally would not have stuff in it that I was trained to use. And sometimes I would look at a patient and go, I know what to do, but I can't do anything about it. And again, it was a feeling of powerlessness and frustration. Maybe another similar story or another story example that some of you might be able to relate to comes from Christian comedian Ken Davis. He, he did a, a talk called Fully Alive and wrote a book called Fully Alive. If you're over 50 and you need something that encourages you and spurs you on into faith uh, for 50 and plus years of life, then pick up his book or watch his, uh, watch his video. It's both hilarious and challenging. But in this particular video, um, and in, this, in his book, he talks about this day, he kind of let his life slide. He let his life slide both physically and spiritually. Although it doesn't have to be, I actually find that many times those two things kind of have a connection together. He kind of reached a point in his life that he just sort of let things go. And he ballooned up in weight, and he wasn't active with anything, he couldn't do too much. Um, he says that one day, he was at the beach with his family. He was at the beach with his family, and he saw his granddaughter out in the water. And the thought hit him that if she got into trouble, he couldn't do anything about it. That if she got into trouble out there, he was not physically capable of being the person that could go out there and rescue him. And that, that sudden insight for him caused him to make some serious lifestyle changes to deal with that sense of powerlessness. Knowing what could or should be done, but not having the ability to do it. Knowing what could or should be done, but not having the ability to do it. As we look at Romans chapter 7 this morning in the first part of Romans chapter 8, this experience is what this passage is addressing. 
an experience of powerlessness, knowing what ought to be, but not seeming to have the ability to do anything about it. Now, we have been working our way. Uh, I've told you we're, we're doing a series on Romans chapter 1. We have barely got out of the verse first yet as we've kind of gone around to other spots in Romans. Um, what we are doing with this series is we're digging deeper into a smaller portion of Scripture, and we'll be there for a while. But as we've been working into Romans, we've been looking at different aspects of our relationship with God, leading up into Romans chapter 8, and into looking at what our relationship is with the Holy Spirit of God. Last week, we looked at two aspects of our relationship with God. And really, last week, what I explained was largely the doctrine, the theology behind what it is to become a Christian. Now, it's not that we need to know and understand all those details before we give our life to Christ, before we receive the gift of salvation through the cross of Christ. Uh, many times through the Scripture, people believed the day they heard the first bits about Jesus. But God has intended for us to grow in maturity and grow in our understanding and grow in our faith and in our doctrine. And so the book of Romans is very dense with its doctrinal and theological understanding of the faith. We began looking last week at two aspects of our relationship with God. The aspect, first aspect that we focused on last week was the judicial aspect of our relationship with God. Our God is a God of complete justice. And our God is a God of complete mercy. And I said last week that forgiveness is not justice. There is no justice in forgiveness. There's no justice in looking at you and saying, you're forgiven. Rather, forgiveness is mercy. And we looked last Sunday at how through the cross of Christ, God absorbed, God atoned, really in himself, in Jesus Christ, what justice requires. The justice for our sin. The justice for all the ways we live life independent from God. Through the cross of Christ, it was atoned. Justice was satisfied so that forgiveness could be offered. We looked last Sunday that when we are in Christ... We make that decision. When we, we don't just become Christians by virtue of being born a human being. We come to the place of recognizing the gift of the cross, and we choose to receive that forgiveness. We choose to receive the grace that comes through the cross. Because in that choice, there is a decision to turn from a life that's lived primarily independently from God, which is the essence of sin, into a life that's lived with saying, God, I want to do life in you. We looked at this judicial aspect. When we are in Christ, the judicial aspect of our relationship with God is satisfied. But as I said last Sunday, many Christians stop at that point. Many Christians see that, or just maybe a little bit past that point. They become Christians, they maybe even go to church regularly, but their life does not move on in maturity to look much different than it was before. There is a judicial aspect to our relationship with God, but I also said last week there is an experiential aspect to our relationship with God. When we become a Christian, there is the presence and power of God in our lives that begins to transform us. It's the power to change. It's the power for something different. And it's something that comes through the Holy Spirit of God who takes up residence within us. We begin to live as new people in Christ and to live with a joy in Christ even when stuff around us is falling apart. The theology term, the doctrinal term for what takes place is something called progressive sanctification. Sanctification is a doctrinal word that means to become more and more like Jesus. And progressive is it happens over a period of time. Unless you are here right now and you are perfect in Christ, 
You are on the process of being progressively sanctified. This is an experience. This is part of the experiential relationship that has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. Being a Christian, understand this, and this is kind of where I want to leave off from last week. Being a Christian, being in Christ, was never meant to be about just knowing stuff in our heads. About knowing things. Being a Christian is meant to be a relationship with God that changes what our lives are about. It's meant to be a supernatural relationship. As we do life together now with God. But as I said, for many, they come to Christ and then they live, continue to live, a frustrated life trying to be Christian out of their own ability. Rather than Growing in Christ through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we stop at knowing, having the knowledge of God, and fail to let that knowledge actually translate into a lived experience, then we will live a frustrated Christian life. That's what this passage is moving us into. As we're looking at what I read this morning in Romans chapter 7, and as we're moved from Romans chapter 7 into Romans chapter 8. It begins to move us, Romans chapter 7 into Romans chapter 8, from this judicial relationship into this experiential relationship with knowing God. So if you have your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or whether you've got it in person or you're using the one in front of you, we're in Romans chapter 7. It's in the New Testament. If you're not sure where it is, open your Bible at the very beginning. There's a table of contents. You can go down there, find the page that Romans is in, and then chapter 7 is where we're at. And those little numbers on your Bible, those are what are the verses. So when I refer to a verse and you're looking in your Bible, the name of the book, and then you look for the big number, which is the chapter, and then the little numbers, those are what we refer to as the verses. So Romans chapter 7, verse 15 says this, For I do not understand my own actions. I do the very thing that I hate. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing that I hate. Goes on to the verse 18, it says this, For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. I want you to hear in this verse this sense, this experience of frustration, this experience of powerlessness. Many aspects, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed with the opportunity to, to go and do a session at the detox center each week, and, and this sounds very much like the first step in the AA program, where trying harder doesn't work. And we have to come to the point of accepting my, uh, my inability to do something. I experience a sense of powerlessness. Paul is talking about that here. I do not understand my own actions. Have you ever had a day like that? You go, why on earth did I do that? Why did that come out of my mouth? Why did I react that way? I mean, I'm a Christian after all. Jesus is in my life. Why did I do that? This is Paul's expression here. For I do not understand my own actions. I do the very thing that I hate. Verse 19, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Why is this? Why is this, if you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit is within you, to bring into your life a power to change, and when we look in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, remember this from last week, you, who, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Well, if I'm a Christian, if I'm in Christ, why is it that I still have this tension or this struggle? I want to give you a theological explanation for why we still struggle with doing the wrong thing. Why, as Christians, we have days that it feels like there's this conflict going on within us. Look at verse 14. This passage gives the explanation for us. It says, for we, for we know that the law or the principle of God are spiritual. 
In other words, he says the law is a re- the law of God. That when we look at the Ten Commandments, that's a reflection of the character of God. That's a reflection of the nature of God, who God is. And when we read the Ten Commandments, what we really have is we have the nature of God codified for us in the Ten Commandments. We see something of what God is like. And when we hold ourselves up to it, we see in the mirror what we're not like. Because none of us is capable of completely satisfying what the Ten Commandments was all about. We have all strayed from the character of God. We've all lived life independent. He says, I know that, this, uh, that, that the law is spiritual. It's good. Verse 14 says, but I am of the flesh. I am of the flesh. See, we still live in this body of flesh that has been infected by the fall. There is still, verse 17 says this, sin that dwells within me. The Bible says earlier in Romans that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is a death that's both a physical death and a spiritual death. And when you become a Christian, you understand you're still going to die one day. The effects of sin on the body, the effects of sin on the flesh, still will carry forward even though we are Christians. In the flesh, it's still that the the curse, the infection of sin from the fall still carries over into all of this natural world for this time being. We see this later in Romans chapter 8. If you look down, starting in verse 20, verse 23, 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but carries on. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Then it goes down into verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly. As we eagerly await the adoption, our, for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, let me explain this. There is part of our salvation yet to come. As people, we still live in this natural world. This natural world has been infected by the curse of the fall. And the consequences of sin are still subject in this natural world. We will still die, barring the second coming of Christ. That is a consequence of sin, for the wages of sin is death. You and I are still waiting as Christians for what Paul describes here in chapter 8, verse 23, as the redemption of our bodies. That is still to take place. The Apostle John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 3. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're not there yet. Our bodies, this body of flesh, is still not free from the effects of the fall on creation. Now, I want to be careful here that you don't get this wrong, um, this wrong idea that has actually been a false teaching all the way back to the second century. It was something called Gnosticism that basically said, spirit is good and flesh is evil. And that's not what God says. God created this world. God created the natural world. And when God finished with his, cre- with his creation, he said that it was very good. It's not that that which is of this world is evil in and of itself, but as a result of the fall, as a result of Adam and Eve's acting in independence of God, creation was subjected to a consequence that carries down to all of us. You and I, and Paul says it in chapter 7, He says that I am of the flesh. I am still in this body of flesh that groans together with all creation, waiting for the future redemption of our body. Paul said earlier, what shall we say then? Understand that that, that's the frustration. We still struggle with this sin nature. And yet Paul says earlier in the book of Romans, what shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin 
continue to live in it. And here's the tension. We become saved in Christ. We receive the grace of God. And maybe we'd be tempted to say, well, because I still live in this body of flesh that still struggles with temptation, that still struggles with a sin that dwells within me, maybe I just let it go, whatever. I'm just going to keep receiving grace. Do we keep receiving grace? Yes. But Paul said that's not the focus of your life. He said sin is still not to have dominion over you. But you will struggle with it because you have not yet received the redemption of your bodies, which is something that is yet to come. You see, as Christians, our lives are no longer to be dominated by sin in the flesh. But that doesn't mean we do not still struggle with it. And we will until the redemption of our bodies. Not one of you here will become perfect in Christ, this side of heaven. Romans 7 describes the conflict, describes the tension. There's no such thing as Christian perfectionism. Paul knows that he hasn't arrived. He knows his life still has unfinished business. He says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war. He knows there's there's a struggle. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul also describes how he hasn't arrived yet. He says, you know what? I, I haven't become yet. I'm not all that I, I'm not what I was, but I'm not all that I will be. He says, but this one thing I do, I leave behind what's behind, and I push forward in Christ. Paul knew that there was still work for the Spirit of God in his life. Let me ask you this morning, can you relate to that? Are there days that you could repeat Paul's words when he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Are there days you relate to that? Who will deliver me from this body of death? The full, complete, final redemption of the body is still to come because of Christ. And Paul says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But maybe you can relate to that. Paul wants us to leave Romans 7 and enter into Romans 8. We will live with this frustration, but there is still a power to live above it. And that is a life in the Holy Spirit. He wants us to see that trying harder doesn't work because there's something within us that grabs a hold of us and we wrestle with it. And we need the presence and power of God through the Holy Spirit for our lives to see sin have a less and less grip on our lived experience. Really, if you're to read Romans through you would see this call for us to leave chapter 7 behind and move in to the hope of chapter 8. Most of your Bibles see this thing heading at the top of it that says life in the Spirit. And this is what follows from this conflict of wretched man that I am. I want to say this. This is the first point we're going to look at. And the only one we're going to look at for the rest of the morning here. The first step to living life in the Spirit And I've said that Romans chapter 8 is about what it is to live in the Spirit. The first step in living life in the Spirit, beginning to live a progressively transformed life in Christ, is this. We need to leave condemnation behind. The first step to living life in the Spirit is to leave condemnation behind. And so we have a chapter break. But take your chapter break out and read it together, and you'll see what is being said here. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore, in spite of this experience, in spite of this tension and conflict we have with, I do the very thing that I hate. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
So what does this mean? I mean, we're being honest here. The struggle, you know, the cliche, you know it. It's overused. The struggle is real. You, you, you know what that is, right? Anyone here struggle with sin in their life in the last week? Okay, there's a few of you honest. The rest of you who are lying are also struggling with sin at this particular moment. You struggle with, I do the third thing. that I, I, I didn't want to do that. that. I know that's not how Jesus wanted me to respond in this situation. Now, you don't have to raise your hand to this. Maybe for some of you, you struggle already this morning as you tried to get your lovely family ready to come to church to worship God. None of you did that with your hands ready to go like this? We struggle with this tension. You just saw someone there just kind of smile and kind of sat back and thought about it. Okay. We struggle with this tension. Anyone here struggle with a quick temper, impatience, lack of love? Struggle to forgive. The struggle is real. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you, you honestly, you can look and say it's not what it once was, and that's good. That's the work of the Spirit in your life. It's not what it once was. I'm so thankful that I don't live with the same degree and spirit of anger in my life that once marked much of my behavior. But I also know that I still struggle at times with it. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and it's not what it once was. Maybe you've seen God do some big things in your life transforming your temperament and your relationships. And if you're in Christ, this must take place. A, very, a, a hugely important work on Christian discipleship came through Pastor Peter Scazzaro in a book called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. The basic premise of his book is this, is, is that you cannot be growing more mature spiritually unless you are also growing more mature emotionally and relationally. The two go together. If you are becoming more mature spiritually in Christ, you are also becoming more mature emotionally and relationally. Sometimes you have people that are Christians, they are actually still babes in Christ. Maybe they've been a Christian um, for two years, maybe they've been a Christian for 35 years. But they're still rather immature in Christ because although there's lots in their head, they can recite the books of the Bible, they can quote scripture to you, they can tell you all the new uh, new teachings and things that are coming out here and there. They're, 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 they're informed, they're connected, they know, but they're still constantly fighting with the people around them. They're still constantly reacting with immaturity within their relationships. You see, knowing stuff about God isn't enough. That knowledge needs to be transformed into an experiential relationship that results in my relationships exhibiting an ever-growing amount of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. We call these things the fruit of the Spirit. They are the work of the Spirit of God in our life as we live this experiential relationship in God. Maybe you're not where you once were because the Holy Spirit has been doing a work in you. But do you still struggle with Romans 7? Do you still struggle with current regrets, with some of the attitudes and actions in your life that don't look like Jesus? i got to say yes. So what do we do with that? Here's the first Christian truth we need to accept if we are to move on in the life of the Spirit. We need to leave condemnation behind. We need to leave a sense of condemnation and judgment behind. Paul goes from this struggle and he begins with those words, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means this, if you blew it today, if you blew it this morning, nothing is held against you. If you blew it in your walk with God, in your temperament, in your reactions, there is nothing that is held against you. You are free. So Paul is saying, because you are free, leave the condemnation behind and get on with right now living. 
Get on with right now living with Jesus in this moment free. And don't get bogged down in condemnation and judgment. You say, but what about there's a consequence? I just can't let this go. Wretched man that I am. And my answer to that is sure, you can. You can because that's what Paul's calling us to here. Because God doesn't hold it against you. If you are in Christ and you struggle with this nature of flesh that has you at times doing the very thing that you hate, if you are in Christ, He doesn't hold it against you, and you don't have to either. See, we often live powerless Christian lives because we don't move on in the Spirit, but instead live life like we need to do penance. We live life like we need to do voluntary self-punishment, and we stay focused on our guilt, and we continue to live in places of shame. And Paul says this, Oh, wretched man that I am, Who will deliver me from this body? For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to live it out. Well, he's going to talk about the power to live differently as we go on. But he begins by saying this, I want you to know that if you are in Christ, you need to leave the condemnation behind. You need to leave the judgment behind. You need to leave even the self-loathing behind. And when we do so, we can move on. You see, when we are caught up in self-condemnation, when we are caught up in believing that God's condemning us, when we're caught up in self-loathing, we cannot go on into maturity in the Spirit. We do not need to do penance in Christ. We do not need to do penance. We do not have to make up for bad behavior as Christians. Oh, we may need to ask for forgiveness, yes, we need to, be, need to ask forgiveness of God and people around us. Uh, we call that confession. And what confession is, is naming it for what it is, owning it for what it is, because change never happens unless you're honest. Change never happens unless you're honest. And so Paul, or sorry, the Apostle John, he's writing to the church, and he says, I, I want you to sit back and realize that if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. But if we confess our sin, and he's talking to believers, confession is just agreeing, admitting it, naming it for what it is. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, to bring change in our lives from all unrighteousness. Oh, we may have to ask forgiveness. We may have to mend some fences and even live this life with some natural consequences. But we do not have to remain in a place of self-loathing or self-condemnation because when we do so, we fail to get on with living life in the Spirit today, this moment. This is the lesson I want us to leave with today. We cannot live in self-condemnation and walk forward in the Spirit at the same time. We cannot live in self-condemnation and walk forward in the Spirit at the same time. Two stories that show this in the Scripture. Two people that you're probably familiar with. They're well known for their betrayals of Jesus. Peter and Judas. Both of them really deserted Jesus in the garden. Peter's or Judas' betrayal of Jesus put him on the cross. And Peter, when he was confronted, aren't you with Jesus? He pretended he didn't even know him. Both of these men experienced self-loathing afterwards. Both of these men experienced self-condemnation afterwards. But only one of them was able to move forward in the love and grace of Jesus. One of them, Peter, heard Jesus ask, simply ask, do you love me? Leave that stuff behind. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Let's move forward in what I have for you. The other one, Judas, he couldn't get past the self-loathing. He couldn't get past the self-condemnation, which is really a focus on himself. When we live in that place, it's really a focus on our performance, on us. I wasn't able to. I failed, and our eyes are on ourselves rather than on the cross of Christ. 
rather on the cross of Christ where our justice was satisfied and forgiven and forgiveness given. See, Judas, he couldn't get past that. And eventually, he chose not even to go on with life. I want to say this, dear people. It is freeing to be able to confess, wretched man that I am, but then move on into Romans 8, 1 and 2. Wretched man that I am, but therefore now live with no condemnation in Christ. Wretched man that I am, live with no condemnation in Christ. Instead, live the law of the Spirit that has set you free. We cannot live in self-condemnation and walk forward in the Spirit at the same time. We have to let the condemnation, the judgment, the self-loathing go if we are to experience the power of the Spirit for change that will follow in Romans chapter 8. So let me ask you this morning, is it possible for some of you your spiritual life is stuck? Is it possible your spiritual life is stuck? For some of you, is it possible that you are stuck because you're really stuck on yourself? You're stuck on your sin. You're stuck on your failures. You're stuck in this place where your performance isn't, I blew it. Rather than on the grace of the cross and the forgiveness that has been given to you. Is it possible? Is it possible that even the risk of self-condemnation keeps you from looking forward to God? Keeps you from looking forward to the possibilities of growing in maturity in Christ from where you are right now? I mean... If I don't look forward with expectation of the Spirit's presence and power in my life, then I won't risk feeling bad when I don't think I measured up. Some of us are so afraid that we might feel bad and live stuck in a place of self-condemnation that we go, let's just hide. And we live with the mantra, nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. If God, if the Spirit of God is at work in your life, there are things that are going to be brought to the surface and brought to the light because He wants to transform them in you. But you have to be willing to let go of that sense of condemnation. You have to stop looking at yourself and your own performance and say, the cross of Christ did it all. Now I am free to move forward in Christ, even though at times I struggle. The title for this morning's message, I haven't referred to it yet, is Leaving Behind the Wild Goose Chase. It's an extension from last week's sermon. See, I don't have to chase God. He is here, and he wants to be at work in my life. Being a Christian is not meant to be a wild goose chase, ever striving but filled with frustration and guilt. But it's also not a life where everything stays the same. There is a power available to live life differently, but we have to let go of something first. And Paul starts with this in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Dear people, too much time and energy, too much time and energy in your life has been wasted on self-imposed penance. For many of you, too much time and energy has been wasted upon self-imposed penance and become an excuse for you not to move forward and follow the Spirit. Christ did away with any sense of judgment and condemnation. The starting point to living in the Spirit is to leave condemnation behind. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Or do you need to hold on to it for some reason? Jesus said, that if he sets us free, we are free indeed. Experiencing the power for change in the spirit comes in the direction that our minds are set, which we will look at next week. But for now, I would suggest this. We have to take our minds off ourselves and leave the condemnation of our conflict with sin. You know, the one that leaves you in Romans 7, crying out, wretched man that I am. You know, that besetting sin that you say, Lord, I just don't seem to have victory over. And because I don't seem to have victory or because I don't get past it, I'm going to quit. The problem is too many Christians focus on victory rather than obedience. 
the outcome of your behavior isn't the most important thing. It's God, will I move forward? Do you love me and will I follow? Own it, yes. Own the things you struggle with, yes. Without confession, without agreeing with God, there is no change. But don't stay there. Leave condemnation behind and move forward in the law of the spirit of life that sets me free. That is the first step to living life in the spirit.
wretched man that I am. The thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Who will save me from this? There is a power for change. It comes in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. But we will not learn what it is to live in the Spirit while we continue to stay focused on places of condemnation. Self-loathing, focused on the sin. Scripture says this, my little, dear, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. We have one that speaks on our behalf. Jesus Christ the righteous. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free. When we focus on the condemnation, we focus on performance, and we focus on ourselves rather than Jesus. Did you blow it today? Will you blow it tomorrow? Probably. Probably. But don't stay focused on that. In Christ, live in the grace that you have received. Acknowledge it and move on. 
because when we stay in places of self-loathing, of self-condemnation, we do not move forward in the life of the Spirit. Are you holding on to something this morning you need to let go of? Are you holding on to something and say, this just, this, this just beats me every time, and you're so focused on that, you're not moving on from it? Maybe it's time to let it go. Maybe it's time in Christ to let the self-loathing go and to say, Lord, it's not about my performance. It's about living in the grace of your cross every moment every day, and moving forward in now, not what has been. The redemption of our bodies will come one day, and this conflict, this tension will end. But until then, we live in this world, and we need to live in the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you peace.